let's start from the premise that food waste cannot by itself solve food poverty, and food poverty by itself will never solve the problem of food waste. The idea that these two are nevertheless linked has merit, however. We're going to be talking about the local situation in the United Kingdom with food banks, food redistribution, so taking surplus food and getting it to hungry people, that common sense solution to where there is need and supply and connecting those two. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that local uh, kind of issue. I'll talk more about um, some of the more global relationships between food poverty in one part of the world and food waste on another. I write fairly extensively about uh, the relationship between our waste in the rich world and hunger on the other side of the world in my book. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is some of the more kind of uh, oblique <coughs> relationships between these two. Um, and I thought I'd start with this very concrete example. Um, you see here some green beans. I'm going to assume everyone's vaguely familiar with this product, even if they don't buy them. And I'll draw your attention to two uh, words in particular on this, this product. Um, the first is uh, the word Kenya, uh, denoting the place from which uh, these beans come. Uh, and the other is the word trim, uh, which is what has been done to these beans. And um, you'll be familiar with the bean in its wholeness. It has a little kind of stalky thing that attached the bean to the plant, and then a little taily, wispy thing at the end. And um, it's fairly natural that when you get one of these beans, you, you want to take at least the, the, the stalky bit off, uh, and maybe the wispy tail. So um, because people are, are so time-pressed these days, um, the supermarkets have come up with the idea of saving them the labor uh, of doing that themselves and, and trimming them for them. Um, but for anyone who has trimmed a bean themselves before, you'll be aware that the bean gets a little bit thinner just at the point where you're going to trim it. And if you look at the beans in this packet, what you notice is that that isn't the case. In fact, the beans have been trimmed right where the bean is still fattest. So that's quite curious to start with, and you sort of ask yourself what, what's going on with the trimming of these beans. And the answer, um, as we discovered, my organization was invited by the United Nations Environment Program to provide a gala dinner for the environment ministers and other UN delegates in Nairobi gathering for the uh, UNEP Governing Council um, in 2013. And our task was to feed these 500 delegates with food that would have been wasted in Kenya. Now, you might think Kenya, a place where millions of people are desperately hungry, uh, a place where land and water are scarce resources, um, surely they don't waste food there in the way that we do in the West. And uh, unfortunately, the case is that they do, not through their own uh, carelessness, which you could attribute a lot of the waste in the West or global North to, um, but uh, firstly, as a result of a lack of agricultural infrastructure, so farmers not having the means to get their products to market before they spoil. Uh, and the other, um, which is the one that we've honed in on, the policies of European supermarkets that are sourcing their horticultural products increasingly from Kenya and other African countries where these products can be grown throughout the year instead of just relying on two months of seasonal supply within Europe. So, um, we went and visited the farmers and the exporters growing these beans and we found that um, essentially, you know, they're being told to, to pack the beans into uh, these, these supermarket packages and these supermarket packs were um, nine centimeters long, precisely. And now, unfortunately, the beans didn't know they had to be nine centimeters long uh, before uh, being harvested. So they grew all sorts of different lengths, 10 centimeters, 14 centimeters. And this means that to get them into those packages, uh, the Kenyan growers and exporters were having to trim off around a third of the entire bean. Um, and this is uh, the kind of thing that you see. But not just a little bit, I mean literally mountains of these, these trimmed off beans. Now when you trim off a third of your bean, you're trimming off a third of the water, and a third of the land, and a third of the labor that has gone into growing these beans. 
And of course, in Kenya, there is still a rich uh, ecosystem, great wildlife, and increasingly they're losing uh, their territories to, to farming and to urban centers. So there's that impact as well. A third of that is, is being wasted. And the really obscene thing about this trimming is that the, the beans that are being trimmed are the ones that have already won the race to get into the pack house. So on the farm, when they're being harvested, anything that is visibly uh, blemished or bendy or too thin or too fat, or if you can actually see the bulb, sort of the bulge in the bean where the bean is, you know what I mean, you know, there's four or five beans in there. If you can see that, anything like that has already been left on the farm. Um, and then it gets into a pack house and there's a test to check that it's the right temperature and that all of those cosmetic standards have been complied with and that they're roughly the right size. Anything that isn't, again, is, is rejected. So these are the ones that have really sort of got through a massive process whereby 30 or 40 percent has already been excluded. These are the winners. And then <coughs> you're cutting off another third just to get them into these uh, nine centimeter packets. And my organization campaigns on food waste and raise public awareness of the issue, of the sources of this issue, and then we put pressure on those businesses and other policy uh, makers that are causing the waste. So um, we came up not just with the dinner that we did for the Environment Minister in Kenya, but we really started to make some kind of grassroots noise about it. We organised a Feeding the 5,000 event, which is a format that I've been using since 2009, where we feed 5,000 people all with food that otherwise would be wasted, and we use that as a platform to talk about the causes and the solutions to food waste, and we do that through building a collaboration of all the different partners in that locality or in that nation who are working on food waste. It's now a, a format that has been used in over about 20 countries uh, to launch national food waste and local and regional food waste campaigns. So uh, we organized one, one of them in Brussels. We took the evidence that we had gathered to some of the supermarkets. Uh, we organized an event like uh, this, which um, is a disco soup. Hands up who knows what a disco soup is? Okay, so this goes through this pretty much the same format. Um, get lots of food that would otherwise have been wasted. Invite the public to come and help prepare it and eat it and give it to other people to eat. And have lots of great music, so you dance while you're chopping. And um, it's uh, become a global movement. It's happened in, uh, I don't know, 25 countries around the world uh, now. And this one was the first in Africa. Um, we did it in December uh, last year. And it was just sort of the tail end of some, some public awareness raising that we were doing. Uh, we've been invited back by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, to continue our investigation, to continue our advocacy, and uh, feed the TEDx on food waste that they were holding in Nairobi. And we gathered uh, some great organizations and individuals together and, and, and had this amazing uh, event where we used all the food from the exporters that was otherwise being wasted. And uh, as I said, we did feeding the 5,000 events to raise awareness about, about the problem. Um, when we engaged the supermarkets here in the United Kingdom with the cause of the food waste and the absurdity of it, um, they actually took some of the points we were making quite seriously and promised um, to change this in their words overnight, um, which is pretty much what happened a few months later, which is overnight by supermarket standards. Um, they came to us and said, okay, we changed the way we specify our beans. We're going to make it use loose packaging so it's uh, less strict on the length. And we now only ask uh, the growers to uh, top the tails rather than topping and tailing. So we think we've got that halfway. Um, and when I went back to Kenya in December, um, I met some of the growers and exporters supplying uh, these supermarkets. And I said, oh, you know, did you have a, a change in the specifications recently? Yeah, yeah. Um, they now only make us top them rather than topping and tailing. And I said, okay, so what impact does that have on, on your waste? It cut their waste by 30% overnight. Um, the value for one relatively small exporter of the beans no longer being wasted because of this halfway mark policy change by one supermarket resulted in a 70,000 euro saving of beans every year. Um, and I did a little back of the envelope, slightly more than back of the envelope, but pretty much back of the envelope calculation, if you applied that one policy change to this one product, just from beans that are exported from Kenya to just the EU, uh, the equivalent savings would amount to 0.03% of the entire economy.
economy of Kenya. So small tweaks, massive gains, economic, environmental, and of course these growers, whatever you think about the rights and wrongs of growing the food in Kenya for European consumers who barely need any more food, we can all agree that wasting a third of it on the way is uh, truly obscene. The other cause of food waste that we identified in Kenya, and I'll stress here that this is something that is not at all exclusive to Kenyan supply chains. Indeed, it is endemic within the practice of European supermarkets, is um, what we refer to as order cancellations or forecast uh, alterations. To give a bit of context on that, um, there is always risk in the market. We never know exactly how much anyone is going to buy at any one time. The weather might uh, suddenly become sunny and we'll all go out and buy beef and salad so we can have barbecues and, uh, uh, and salad. Um, then it might get rainy and we'll stop buying those things. So there is a risk in the market and that's uh, inherent uh, in the way in which we operate our supply chains. The question, however, is who bears that risk? And you might think that we, or at least the supermarkets, should bear that risk, should, should carry the costs of any, any mistakes that are made. And unfortunately, the supermarkets are so disproportionately powerful within the supply chains because they operate in a very consolidated market. There's only four or five companies in the UK, for example, and they operate 80% of the grocery sales in this country. So while there are thousands and thousands of suppliers, if one particular supplier doesn't like what the supermarkets are doing, the supermarkets can say, oh, okay, we'll get our product from somewhere else. So they're relative to the supermarkets powerless in that supply chain. And that situation is amplified when you talk about smallholder farmers in Kenya who are operating on a scale of one or two acres. Um, and so what we found is that order cancellations were rife, usually conducted by middlemen at the uh, supermarkets, pretty much used to insulate them from this kind of practice. And stuff was being you know, grown to forecast, so they'd get a forecast if they want 10 tons of beans every week during the summer or thereabouts, and so the beans would be grown, they'd be harvested, they'd be brought to the pack house, and then the day before, the day after, uh, the day of, uh, the beans due to be uh, sort of loaded onto an aeroplane and flown all the way to Europe, they'd get the confirmed order and it would be, say, half of what was actually forecast. And in those instances, the farmers and exporters are not actually being paid anything for that product. Um, now, what that results in is scenes like this. This is one of the depots. It's actually a UK company with a depot outside uh, Nairobi Airport, and they are wasting 20 tons of perfectly good food every single day, at least, through a combination of cosmetic standards and these order cancellations. Um, where possible, the exporter will then offload the cost of that onto the farmers that are supplying them. So they will reject the produce, send it back to the farms and say, sorry, the order disappeared, or sorry, it didn't comply with cosmetic standards, and therefore we're not going to pay you, or we're going to deduct a certain percentage from what we agreed. Um, not only is stuff rejected from uh, the export uh, depot, but on the farms themselves, um, crops are just left in the field. And what you can see here is an entire crop of basil being destroyed <coughs> by day laborers who are working for less than $2 a day. And they explained to us that when this happens, it's a regular occurrence, they only get paid half wages. And they explained that that meant that they risked losing their rented homes, they couldn't send their kids to school, and they very often couldn't put food on the plates of uh, their children. So the risk that exists in the market is being passed down and down and down the chain, and ultimately the people that bear the cost of that risk are the people who can least afford to do so. I don't know a single consumer in Europe who thinks that that's okay, and yet that is the system that we currently pay for. The waste that you saw in the previous slide um, is not only uh, not being paid for, but the people who come and collect that waste and take it away have to sign a document saying that they will not feed it to people. It has to be treated as green waste. Um, and this is the kind of crime that we are basically brought into. 
uh, when we operate within a European food system. The relationship here between the food that's being wasted and uh, food poverty, poverty more generally, and social justice, is very, very direct. Um, these people are, are, are suffering as a result of, um, of the policies of, of the supermarkets that we uphold. The British Parliament uh, addressed this issue with a really substantial piece of legislation that came through in 2013 after years of modelling. It's called the Groceries Code Adjudicator Act. Has anyone heard of that? Well, that's the question that we asked all of the Kenyan farmers that we met in Kenya, and the answer was fairly similar. No, they haven't heard of the Groceries Code Adjudicator Act. How could they? And yet they are protected by it. Essentially, the Groceries Code Adjudicator Act says that when a supermarket cancels an order or adjusts its forecast with the result that a supplier is caused to waste food, the cost of that should be shared or borne by the supermarket. It is no longer the case that supermarkets can just cancel an order and offload the cost. At least, not technically. However, the use of middlemen can result in uh, a shielding of the supermarket by the middleman. So the middleman is not governed by the GTA, the Gross Code Duty Trade Act, only the supermarkets are. So if the middleman has cancelled an order, in order to bring a case to the groceries code adjudicator, you actually have to demonstrate that that original order cancellation came from the supermarket. And that is essentially the work that my organisation Feedback is currently doing in Africa uh, and, uh, and elsewhere. This is another example of what I was talking about, a lady who's harvesting a couple of acres near Mount Kenya. Um, and she's had her order cancelled. She's not going to pick a single one of these Mange 2, ironically called Mange 2. Um, not a single one of these, these will actually be Mange at all. Um, so we have this legislative uh, tool now in the United Kingdom. Uh, we are gathering evidence at the moment uh, of violations of the code of practice and we'll submit them to Christine Tacon, who is the Groceries Code Adjudicator, in order to use a legislative framework to address uh, essentially this imbalance of power and the waste and the poverty that it causes. Um, there is a great opportunity at the European level this year with a consultation with all the member states who are being asked about what legislative regimes they have to address this problem. So there's a hope that at the start we'll get a voluntary code that the supermarkets will be invited to sign up to. We will demonstrate that that voluntary code doesn't work as it did in the United Kingdom and ultimately hopefully bring about an EU-wide legislative framework to address that problem. Um, close to home, one of the solutions that my organisation has put in place to address on-farm food waste, so when orders are cancelled, when product is uh, not complying with cosmetic standards, or simply when prices aren't good enough to warrant harvesting, or because of a natural glut, um, you get a spell of good weather like this and all your brassica and your lettuces are suddenly ready for harvesting, and maybe you haven't got the market for it. So it's going to be wasted. Uh, we invite farmers around the UK to get in touch with us and say, well, we have a field full of lettuces, not going to harvest it, and we, we go gleaning. Um, the gleaning network uh, takes volunteers to those fields, harvest it, and give it to charities like Fair Share or anyone else who are feeding hungry people. And it's filling uh, a real need on the part of some of the food charities uh, that have been doing great work for many, many years but um, have relied very much on uh, stable ambient products uh, from supermarkets and manufacturers and have had a deficiency of fresh fruit and vegetables. And yet at the same time on farms, all these fresh fruit and vegetables are being wasted. So we're bringing uh, you know, highly nutritious, usually quite local uh, fruit and vegetables into that supply chain. And of course, using that as a platform to uh, raise awareness about the root causes of this problem in order then to bring pressure uh, onto supermarkets and other policy makers to address the root causes of that food waste. Um, so it is both a sticking plaster solution, feeding hungry people with surplus food that would otherwise be wasted, but also an attempt to put, uh, uh, put in place systemic changes to, to, to reduce the problem at source. Um, I don't know if anyone saw Jamie Oliver's last uh, Friday night feed, did anyone see that? We had an episode of Penn with us, him and, uh, him and Jamie. We got something like 5,000 uh, gleaming uh, volunteer 
their sign-ups in about four seconds, it crashed our website. Um, so thanks for that, Jamie. Um, if anyone <coughs> thinks that Sheffield is in need of a cleaning network, I think we have the nearest one, the hub, the nearest hub we have to here is in Manchester. Um, sign up on our website, it's uh, feedbackglobal.org, um, and just put your name down. As I say, we haven't got a hub in Sheffield at the moment, but who knows, uh, in the coming months, one might emerge. The website is feedbackglobal.org. Go on there. Uh, that's the website of my organisation, Feedback um, and Gleaming Network. You'll see. If you say, if you click on Join the Movement, you'll be invited to sign the food waste page. I pledge to reduce my food waste, and I demand that businesses do the same. And I think it will offer for you to sign up to the Gleaming Network as well. Um, so come, come glean with us. Um, what have I got? Another five, five, five minutes here. Um, we're now moving into Latin America. I've actually been to Ecuador once before, and this is the kind of thing I found. Bananas, same problem, different crop. Um, these are all the bananas being wasted from one plantation after one day of harvest. Um, supply in the European supermarket. So we are off to Latin America. If anyone has contacts in Latin America um, within the horticultural export sector or there, thereabouts, um, be very interested to hear from you. Um, we're going to be talking about food research. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but um, what I've looked at is that on farm waste, and of course that just carries on down and down the chain you get supermarkets uh, like this one, we fill their bins with perfectly good food. Whilst it is true that this represents a very small percentage of your overall waste from plow to plate, the back of store supermarket waste, um, one of the things I really want to emphasize, in case anyone has been reading communications from the supermarkets themselves or the British Retail Consortium, who say, oh, well, supermarkets are only responsible for 2% of the food waste that happens from plow to plate. Most of it is the consumer's fault. Has anyone heard that? Kind of message before, most of the food waste happens on consumer level. Um, that is bogus, uh, and I will lay out a couple of reasons why I regard it as bogus. Firstly, when we look at consumer food waste in the UK, we've done very forensic kind of examination of what's in our bins, and of course, for a for a consumer or for a householder, all of their waste is going into that bin, so everything is counted against them. It's currently includes, when you look at the pie chart that are uh, um, developed, both the edible waste and also the inedible stuff, like the banana skins and tea bags. So that's the first issue. And then to look at the supply chain waste, firstly, no one has measured food waste on farms, so that's left off the books. Secondly, it leaves off all of the fish that are wasted, the discards at sea, none of that is counted. It leaves off all of the edible offal, those inside bits of the animals that used to be part of our gastronomic heritage and no longer are. None of that that is at best fed to dogs and cats uh, and very often just disposed of, uh, is counted. And fourthly, and most importantly, none of the food uh, that is wasted in the supply chains of our supermarkets overseas is wasted, which for a country that imports most of its food is obviously quite a big omission. Um, so they count all of the food waste and more against consumers. They leave off a large percentage of the food waste on the part of the industry. And then, then they say, oh look, consumers are responsible for most of the food waste. And then the supermarkets say, well, if you look at within our businesses, the stuff ends up in our bins, it's a tiny fraction of all that. And yet, as I've just, I hope, demonstrated, the food waste that is being wasted further in the supply chain isn't in the supermarkets own business precisely because they have got the power to offload that waste and its costs onto their suppliers, so they are still responsible for it. And therefore, supermarkets are, I think, legitimately one of the principal targets of advocacy and campaigning on this issue. Um, we've all heard about those 9 billion people on the way who are going to be on the planet by 2050. How on earth are we going to feed them? And Unfortunately, one of the dominant responses to that situation, both the increasing population and also the diet shift, the famous diet shift for more meat and dairy products, 
uh, particularly in countries like India and China, the main kind of dominant response to that has been, oh, well, the solution is we've got to grow more food, right? Otherwise, people are going to go hungry. 60% increase, 70% increase. Some people even say we need to double food production by 2050. Unfortunately, the main way in which we increase food nowadays, increase food production, is in the traditional way. So we've seen, you know, productivity increases in the second half of the second, uh, second half of the, uh, of the 20th century were phenomenal through the introduction of fertilizers and F1 hybrids, and we all know the Green Revolution and the story behind that. But that's over, pretty much. Increase in productivity per acre is going up at a minuscule level. If you want to massively increase food production, which is what we're doing at the moment, the way in which we're doing it is extending the amount of land that is being cultivated, and that means deforesting and plowing up wild habitats. It is the single biggest impact that humans have on the planet. People often think cities, heating, transport, factories, industry, those are the big producer of emissions environmental impacts. The biggest impact that humans have had on nature is food production. And largely, that is through the extension of the agricultural frontier. So the idea of doubling or increasing food production dramatically without having in place, as we don't, any of the safeguards to protect the world's remaining forest. I was just having a conversation with Monica, who uh, is one of the grant from the PhD students. She tells me she's from the Philippines that they have three or four or six percent remaining of their wild forests. In Europe, it's something similar. Doing this not only results in the mass extinction event that we are all currently part of, but obviously in future, has uh, runs the risk of creating a climate in which hydrological cycles have been interrupted and climate change is at catastrophic levels. And that is the one real risk that there is to global food security uh, and, and hunger, undermining the planet's ability to provide really enough food. At the present moment, we already grow easily enough to feed 9 billion people, 12 billion even. If you look at the food supply that is actually available to, shop, to people in shops and restaurants in every country in the world, as I did in this chart for my, my book published back in 2009, you can see, so this is on the vertical axis, the food availability given as a percentage of food requirements. So if you had a country that only had exactly what its population needed to survive, it would be on 100% right down at the bottom. All rich countries in Western Europe and North America have between one and a half and two times the number of calories, and this is exclusively on calories, one and a half and two times the calories that they actually need in their shops and restaurants available to that population. Some of that results in overconsumption, so people eating more than they need, and the rest is waste. And whenever I hear the mantra that we need to increase food production, I think of this, and I think, well, actually, you've got two massive problems, food waste and a public health disaster resulting from overconsumption. And we're saying we need to produce more food when there are actually no guarantees that increased food production will go to those people who actually need it. I'm going to end with um, a couple of quotes. Uh, one great 50s, uh, anyone come across the date, Bartholomew, uh, Pearl King. The monkey speaks his mind. He says it's a, it's a disgrace to imagine that. You'll never see a monkey build a fence around a coconut tree and let all the coconuts go to waste, forbidding all other monkeys to come and taste. Why, if I put a fence around this tree, starvation will force you to steal from me. What it's getting at is the untenable moral situation where those with and those who are wasting actually prevent people who are hungry from accessing the food that they really need for survival. Indeed, towards the end of my book, which was basically a 350-page thesis and data arguing that very case, I came across this passage by 17th-century philosopher John Locke, uh, who in his Second Treatise of Government, published in 1690, laid out pretty much, I thought, well, why did I bother writing 350 pages in one paragraph? He's saying that, and I'll, I'll leave you, I'm not going to read the quote, I'll leave you to read it and jump in with questions at this stage. We've got, if I run into my question time, I have. Yeah, sorry. Um, he's saying that 
if somebody who grows food wastes it, they not only lose the right to the food, but they lose the right to the land on which it was grown. He's writing at the time of the enclosures, that time when the concept of land being private property, pro property was first created and passed through the Enclosure Acts through Parliament. The idea that land was in the private ownership of individuals. The basis for that was that those individuals would put labour into the land and increase productivity overall, thereby making more food available to more people. And he said, fine, but that puts an obligation on those who have that land to make that food available. The moment they waste it, the premise is, is gone. So do we have the right to withhold food? Do we have the right even to own the land on which our food is grown when we are currently wasting so much of it? Thanks very much.
whilst the volumes of those particular lines are relatively small at the moment, they do have a public awareness raising uh, benefit. What I'm anxious about is that supermarkets are using it as a greenwashing uh, device to make themselves look like they're taking the issue seriously. But what I will say is that whilst those specifically marketed ugly fruit and vegetables are one thing, reducing and relaxing the cosmetic standards in the way, for example, that I showed with those beans has really made progress here in the United Kingdom since we launched our campaign in 2009. It's going to sound funny. Ugly fruit and vegetables have been the fastest growing sector of the fresh produce market. They're not being marketed as ugly fruit and vegetables. If you go into Tesco and you buy their value carrot, they don't say ugly, they're value carrot. Those are the carrots that used to be being uh, fed to pigs or left in the ground. And in 2012, just to give you an idea of the scale of the thing I'm talking about, 300,000 tonnes of UK-grown ugly fruit and vegetables that would have been wasted normally were actually sold both through supermarkets and the booming uh, social enterprise sector that are transforming some of these products into chutneys and jams and all sorts of things and selling themselves as food waste production uh, devices. So there has been a change. I do think that uh, we, the people that are capable of transforming the system that we currently buy into, I really I think that the idea of having a sustainable food system is so far off. The idea of being able to arrest the mass extinction event and climate change and a billion hungry people. It's the chance of us being able to do it is becoming vanishingly small. Probably by the end of the century, the most of the species on this planet will be extinct. But there is still that chance. And I think we, we have the power and I would say the responsibility to put everything we have into realizing that opportunity, that small opportunity.